Good evening. We welcome you to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Normally we'd be having that here at the building, but because of this coronavirus uh, pandemic, it's just Brother Jeremy Jones and myself tonight. I'll be doing the lesson, and Brother Jeremy Jones will be running the live stream. I hope you've been uh, enjoying our study of Malachi. Uh, our intent is to finish that book tonight. Uh, we wish that you would join us on Sunday morning for our worship service, which will be live streamed at 1030. Uh, Brother Aaron Foster is scheduled to preach this coming Sunday. We are, as I indicated before, studying Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4, and this will conclude our study of this book. We've seen in the study of Malachi, first chapter 1 and chapter 2, that God is really upset with the children of Israel. Uh, last week in our study of chapter 2, we saw that the priests were sinful in their own behavior and were partial or incomplete in the way they were teaching God's law. As we begin chapters 3 and 4, we're going to go into a transition. There will be prophecies. First, a prophecy about the coming of John the Baptist, and then a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a difference in the way the Word of God refers to the children of Israel. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 9, they're called the whole nation, rather than a more endearing term like people of God. Now they're told that they can repent, but in reality they're about to face 400 years of darkness before the coming of Jesus Christ. Let's begin by looking at Malachi 3 and verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the, his temple even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. And behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. You know, Malachi 3 and verse 1 contains a prophecy about the coming of John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord. And it also promises the actual coming of the Lord himself. Back in Malachi 2 and verse 7, they had asked, Where is the God of justice? And here in Malachi 3 and verse 1, they are told that the Lord himself is going to be coming to the earth. Now as we move on to verses 2 and 3, But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. <clears throat> Here in the last book of the Old Testament, we find references to the Christian age. Peter in his writings in 1 Peter the first chapter and also in 1 Peter the second chapter had words that tell you that he was familiar with this prophecy in Malachi 3. In, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 7, he talked about them being tested by fire, or Christians being tested by fire. And in chapter 2 and verse 5, when he said, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Israelite sacrifices had been unacceptable, but now the sacrifices of Christians are going to be acceptable. I've just got a few thoughts about Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. You know, when the messenger comes, he'll be like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now we know about the refining process. <clears throat> the raw materials 
are heated up until it melts. Then the impurities separate from the pure metal. The impurities rise to the top and can be skimmed off. The messenger, or Jesus Christ, will be the refiner who separates the good from the bad. He can also purify, but Jesus Christ can also purge. When you think about the fuller soap, it's also a metaphor that indicates that Christ will cleanse and purify. Fuller soap uh, was used to whiten cloth, and thus it indicates that our soul will be washed whiter than snow. You'll remember back in the 51st Psalm, the great repentant Psalm of David, he wanted to be cleansed and be as white as snow. And when Paul or when John wrote Jesus' words to the church in Sardis in Revelation 3 and verse 5, he talked about them that overcome being dressed in white garments. We understand that these verses that uh, Malachi were given to assure the priests and the Levites that God had not gone away. Actually, God was working in his own timeline. So many times God's timeline is different than our timeline. At the appropriate time, the messenger would be sent to purify, to purge, and to whiten. And it's so important to know that the righteous would survive the process, but the wicked would be purged and put away. Now in verse 4, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. There would be a return to true worship of God, different than what the Lord had found there in the days of Malachi. It will be pleasant to the Lord. And all of this is tied to the prophecy in Malachi 3.1 of Jesus coming to the earth. Now in verse 5, And I will come near you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord. You know, God's law sets expectations for the righteous living. And the Jews of Malachi's day had neglected God's law. And he's telling them that there's going to be a Christian age coming, and Jesus will be a swift witness against sin. When I read about this, I, I am reminded of what Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, where he talked about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and he contrasted that with the wonderful fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23 of the same chapter. I want you to notice that last statement in verse 5. They were in this trouble because they do not fear me. Remember what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandment. For this is man's all, and that was what they were not doing. In verses 6 and 7, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? What a powerful and awesome statement is made about God Himself in Malachi 3 and verse 6. Did you pick up on what that statement was? What was that powerful statement that was made about God Himself? God does not change. I think it's important for us to notice the context in which this is shared. 
You know, God had made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and then to Jacob to bless all the nations of the world through their seed. The Jews had disobeyed God and they deserved condemnation, but because of His promise, He would wait. God would wait 400 more years until Jesus would come to this earth to begin His ministry. And also we can see there that, that God is a God of forgiveness because also contained in verse 6, God says to return to me and I will return to you. Sinners always seem to need more information. And the Jews in Malachi's day ask, in what way shall we return? Well, in verse 3, he gives them an answer. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have, you rob, have we robbed you? in tithes and offerings. I know Brother V.P. Black wrote a whole book on will a man rob God. He was pointing out to us in that book, and God was pointing out to them, that he notices giving. He notices giving then, and he also notices our giving today. Let's look at verses 3 through 9, or 9 through 12, excuse me. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of, our, of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. How does Malachi chapter 3 teach us about the providence of God? You just think about what we've just read. The things that they're experiencing and the things that they could experience in, experience are all in God's control. So how does chapter 3 teach us about the providence of God? I'd suggest to you that God is telling them that He is behind their lack of material blessings because they've been robbing Him. You'll remember when we studied back earlier in Malachi, they were bringing the blind, the sick, the lame, not their best sacrifices. They were getting rid of the poor in their livestock. And God is also telling them that repentance followed by a change in behavior will open a floodgate of blessings from Him. You know, Jesus talked about the providence of God. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. There in Matthew 6, he was talking about food, clothing, and shelter. God is in control of this world, and he's letting these people in Malachi know that he could open up the floodgates of heaven with blessings if they would just turn to Him. You know, it makes us think. Things can change so quickly. We see how this COVID-19 pandemic is destroying much of the world's economy. Don't you think it should be a wake-up call for us to be serious about our obedience to God? There in beginning in verse 13, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, What have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept your ordinances? 
and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do not, who do wickedness, are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Another class question. What have they said that has upset God? You ever think that our words can upset God? Their words had upset God. Now let's just look at a few of the things that they said. They said it's useless to serve God. There are no consequences to being good or being bad. They had asked what profit is it that we have kept His ordinances. Sounds a little bit like Peter when Peter asked Jesus, you know, Lord, we've given up everything and what's in it for us? You remember Jesus' answer in this life, a hundredfold, and in the life to come, eternal life. They were calling evildoers blessed. God does not like it when we call evil good and good evil. And they were saying that there were wicked that had been raised up, or there were wicked people that were being blessed because they were wicked. They were saying that God was not a God of justice. Verses 16 through 18, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard, So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. There are some important facts buried in these three verses. One of those important facts is that God records the names of the righteous. You know, even in the New Testament, there is eternal importance put on having our name in the book of life. Next to the last chapter in the Bible, we we read, but there shall be no by no means enter it, meaning heaven, anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 3 ends by reminding us, number one, God knows. And number two, God remembers. Now let's move on to chapter 4. It's a very short chapter, just six verses. The first three verses say, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like all fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, and they shall be ashes upon your soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. There are some eternal truths buried here. In verse 1, judgment day is coming. In verse 2, the Son of Righteousness, referring to Jesus, will bring the light of truth into this world. And in verse 3, the righteous will be able to overcome the wickedness of this world. I am reminded of Revelation 21 in verse 7, which says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And then the last three verses, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold... I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 
as we look at what's buried in these three verses. Verse 4 reminds us that they are living under a law that God expects them to obey. The whole reason that Malachi is talking to them is because they had not been obeying the ordinances of God. Verse 5 is another important prophecy of the coming of John the Baptist. And verse 6 raises the prophecy of the curse for those who rejected the teaching of John the Baptist. And that was certainly fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. With the end of Malachi, the world experienced about 400 years with no new scripture from God. When I think about the message in the book of Malachi, it is repent, for the Messiah is coming. I hope that you have enjoyed our study of this book. Now would you bow with me in prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, we know that you are all-powerful. We know that you never change. We know that your timeline is different than our timeline but you have planned our future even before the foundation of the world. And we pray that we would respect your word, understand it, and obey it. We're so thankful for the coming of your precious son, Jesus. We're thankful for the shedding of his blood, for its redemptive power. And we pray, Father, that you would bless the church, that you would bless us as your servants. Help us truly to love you, to respect you, and to respect your word, and to love one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.